Oh, Mrs. Robinson. Robinson. Hey, Mr. Robinson. Hey, Mr. Hello, Robinson. everyone. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Hey. Good. Great. Great. Well, thank you. Good Go ahead. Oh, I just said we always see Miss Harris. She looks like she's oh, an art hello. teacher in her yes. room. Yeah. Look at that amazing artwork behind her. That is beautiful. So I love that flower. <laughs> just a heads up, everyone. We're in recording. Yes. Okay. All right. Hey, Kyle. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> hello. hello. I, I was sending a student your way, but I realized she's in class in the other room right now, so she probably won't okay. be coming. Yeah, that's okay. Just learning. Yeah, we're recording this, so anytime, anything, you guys can always play it for your students so that they know what a portfolio is and um, also that careers in art are real. And that, that's really our goal, so let's... Um, we can um, begin the welcome if everyone's ready. Uh, today we are here with, oh, I counted them just before this, but about 12 guest speakers, which is really sort of like a mini conference of all sorts of things that are gonna happen. We see students here as well that are interested in being artists. And you guys, this is for you and your parents because um, some of your parents may be totally cool with this whole um, art thing. Some of them might need to know a little bit about all the art careers. So you listen to that part and you explain to your parents, hey, here are some real careers in art. And we have the amazing Savannah College of Art and Design here with Mr. O'Donnell. And he is going to take you through what a portfolio is. And you guys, as an artist and even my programming teacher, he was talking about programming portfolios. As a professional these days, you need to have a portfolio and you need to show rather than tell what you're doing. And we're gonna show you guys how to build an art portfolio and how Dillard can help you with that. And we have six amazing teachers, um, students here from Dillard, but we also have our amazing principal, Cassandra Robinson. Hey, Mrs. Robinson. Can Hello, hello everyone. Thank you, Ms. Swanson. I just want to very quickly say thank you to everyone who's joining us this evening. And Ms. Swanson has already said it, but just to reiterate tonight, the purpose of tonight is to share with you the importance of creating that great portfolio that's going to land you into the right school, get you that right job. So I want you to really pay attention today. And I want to thank you um, our sponsors from uh, Savannah which School of Design, if I'm not mistaken, and all yeah, of our other, okay, I'm sorry, and all of our other guests who are here this this evening. Thank you so much for joining us, and a special thank you to the magnet coordinator, Miss, and our artistic director, Mr. Charles, for putting this event together. So again, thank you parents and students for coming and listen very carefully because we have some great information. And thank you for considering Dillard High School as your school of choice for your high school career. So thank you and enjoy the evening. I'm gonna be on for a little bit and then jumping off to my next meeting. Thank you, Ms. Swanson. Thank you so much, Mrs. Robinson. And now we're going to have the teachers and um, introduce themselves, then we are going to go into, uh, Will is going to do his presentation and then we will move into our three alumni speakers and then back to the teachers with Portfolio Day. So um, Ms. Black, how are Hi. you this evening? Hi everyone, Mrs. Black here. Um, so I, I teach uh, AP and Honors Art History as well as uh, 3D sculpture and pottery honors and AP, as well as some other drawing classes. And, and um, I'm really happy you're here and I'm happy to be here with you. Great, and we also have Ms. DePuzo. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ms. DePuzo. I teach digital art and imaging. Um, I also teach AP, 2D art and design and photography. 
Amazing, thank you. And we have Ms. Dion. Evening, everyone. My name is Ms. Dion. I teach two-dimensional and three-dimensional intro art classes. And I have experience in murals and architecture and a lot of other fun things, including clay hand building. And then we have Mr. Joseph. Hello, hello everyone. Really nice to see a lot of fresh faces tonight. My name is Mr. Celestin Joseph. I teach uh, AP drawing, AP 2D design, uh, arts collab, senior portfolio class, as well as some of the general art courses and the freshman incoming magnet students as well for uh, drawing. Thank you for coming in this evening, everyone. And then we have Mr. Lopez de Victoria. Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Mr. Lopez de Victoria. Uh, I teach film, animation, and visual technology. Great, thank you. And then we have Mr. Thompson. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mr. Thompson. I teach six through 12, all classes, all grades. I am what you would call your experimental arts teacher. I teach Illustrator, Photoshop, a little bit of After Effects. We're working on 3D design now, so Blender, Maya, things of that nature, and also web design. So if you have any of those interests, I am where you start. Thank you so much, Mr. Thompson and all the amazing teachers. And now we, I'm gonna introduce Mr. Charles and then we are going to go into the first five slides of the PowerPoint. And then we're gonna go back to um, Will with um, SCAD and we're gonna go into his PowerPoint. Good evening, everybody. I'm Israel Charles, the Artistic Director for the Visual and Performing Arts Magnet program. Welcome aboard. Glad to have you. All right. So if Sam, if you can bring up the PowerPoint, that would be great. And we'll do the first five slides. And that sort of slides us right into SCAD and then we will be great. All right. And this is what we're here for is the, there we are. Did it? There we go. Portfolio Building Day, it's a day for you to build the skills that you need to be an artist and have a career in art. And we hope that you find all of those pieces here at Dillard. In the next slide. And just this is a little agenda. So we're going to be sticking to this and you'll be able to see all sorts of amazing things. Uh, pay attention to the alumni and if you have any questions for them, you can type in the chat or any questions for any of the teachers at any time, just type in the chat, we'll answer them. And then at the end, we'll turn our cameras on and you guys can ask us all sorts of questions about art and everything else. And we'll be happy to answer them. And that'll be the fun part. All right, next slide for Mr. Charles. Oh, okay. Yeah, guys. <laughs> so one. Or go one more and then we'll go back to this one. Yeah, before we hear from Mr. O'Donnell, um, again, we want to thank you for coming on and, and spending some time with us. I always like to say any time that you, you could be doing a lot of different things this evening, but you've chosen to spend your time with us. And for that, we really appreciate it. Uh, there are a lot of students on the call. Some of you are scheduled to join us next year. Some of you may just be coming and you're already at a, a middle school and maybe there's another high school you're slated to go to. But I wanna let you know, everyone that's listening, if there's something here that piques your interest, we want you to know that there's no better place to start your journey as a professional artist than right here at the Center for the Arts and Emerging Computer Technology. And one of the reasons that we feel that way is our track record based on our core objective, which is to make sure that we provide you with the competitive edge at the next level. In other words, when you leave the Center for the Arts and you have that opportunity to present your portfolio for Savannah College of Art and Design, you will have that competitive edge over most students because of the training, the tutelage, the nurturing, and the experience that you're gonna have at the Center for the Arts. We have an award-winning program and we have a nurturing facu faculty that are outstanding with respect to the pedagogy, the manner that the curriculum is just, uh, laid out for you, 
And so we're really excited to not only share these opportunities about the arts with you, but just let you know that Dilla Center for the Arts is a place that you can come uh, and get this type of training in the uh, visual and performing arts and the emerging computer technology program, and you can get it every day. Right. And now, I think we are ready to bring on our special guest, which we're delighted to have, Mr. Will O'Donnell from the Savannah College of Art and Design to spend some time to do what I like to call drop some important nuggets. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm going to totally steal that. Um, my name is Will O'Donnell. I'm the Director of Training and Development for SCAD's admission program, but I'm also Portfolio Review Coordinator for the college. I have my undergraduate degree from SCAD, Bachelor of Fine Arts and Sequential Art, which is comic books, storyboards for animation, concept art. My joke is I look like Clark Kent, so of course I studied comics, and now I kind of look like his dad. Um, <laughs> I also uh, have my master's from SCAD. I'm a design management and project leadership master from the college, too. Um, it's just, it's really a joy to be here, to be able to share what I love, which is art and creating art, and to talk today about something that's very important, and it's something that once you start, you can never stop, and that's building your portfolio. And the, from the first day that you, you know, drew a house and a sun and little stick figures next to it, that's when it started for you. And some of you want to pursue this, and some of you just really enjoy it right now, and you're, you're like, hey, I like to draw, I like to paint, I want to I want to do something creative with my, my future. Um, that could lead to many ways, many things. Like we actually have quite a few alumni at Disney. Uh, we have quite a few alumni uh, working in places like Microsoft, or Blizzard, designing characters for games like Overwatch and, and uh, World of Warcraft. We have people um, doing all kinds of incredible, incredible work out in the industry. We have fashion designers working at Gucci. We have you know, um, product designers working for Samsung, creating driverless car interface. Like that. So um, all of the art schools out there, and you're going to hear from some alumni from some other really, really incredible schools too. And so I'm excited that you'll get to kind of see a wide perspective here and, and get to ask these folks a lot of questions. And uh, I'm excited to get going here. I'm going to talk to you about kind of what what makes a good portfolio, um, the essential elements, and I will actually kind of peel back the curtain and tell you that these are the things that I look at, me and the portfolio review committee here at SCAD made up of professors and alumni, we look at pieces and this is how we, we give them score. So listen closely because this is information that could really help you in a few years. Um, I definitely wanna encourage you to visit our website as well, scad.edu where we have all kinds of information. Uh, come and visit us. We're in beautiful Savannah, Georgia. We have a campus in Atlanta as well. Uh, if you happen to be in Lacoste in the south of France, we have a location there. You can visit. Um, I would love to be there as well. <laughs> um, but if we're ready, um, Sam, I think we'll get started with the PowerPoint and we'll just launch right into it. All right. So the first, uh, first slide here is just kind of an example of some inspirational words. We. Uh, uh, graphic design is one of the most popular majors at SCAD, and so um, I apologize because I graphic designed everything after this one, so I wanted us to appreciate this for a moment, uh, and then we will uh, kind of launch into our first slide. So let's, let's talk about what is a portfolio. This uh, talk I like to call visual art techniques. Um, these, are, these are elements that you can use to be successful. Um, designing a portfolio for, for if you were thinking about going to SCAD or going to any art college. These are just tips that could, could definitely um, help you in the process. And I'm kind of a blue, there we go. Okay. Um, I still see a blue square, so maybe that there's a chat open. You can close that. That usually takes care of it. Um, okay, there we go. Let's go back one. All right, so these are, I like to call the three main elements of a successful portfolio. And then we have plagiarism, which I will talk about separately. It's not a, an element of a successful portfolio, but it is important to know what it is and to avoid it. But let's talk about the first piece of the pie. I like to say that, you know, a portfolio is kind of a, you know, a, a pie graph, if you will, not very exciting or artistic, but um, half of that pie graph is made up of creativity, originality, creative voice and, and your own passions, okay? Your storytelling ability. Um, a quarter of that is presentation, 
Um, it's the very simple things. You might take it for common sense. Like it's making sure that we're showing your artwork in a way that we wanna take it seriously. So it's making sure that you put your drawings on paper that's not fine paper, making sure that you know when you crop your images, they go all the way to the edge and it's, it's respecting your work so others will respect it. So we'll talk about a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk about technique. This is what you've been learning ever since kindergarten. You're learning the elements and principles of art. And I'm gonna show you some examples of a, a scholarship competition we have called the TAB Challenge. Um, and this is where juniors and seniors and transfer and grad students now compete for scholarships at SCAD. And you'll see some really excellent examples of some of these elements and principles that I've been talking about. Um, and then obviously uh, to talk about the creative voice, it's, I can't stress it enough. It's the most important part of a portfolio, of a successful portfolio. You are building these technical skills and, and it's good to stretch your, your wings and practice the still life and life drawing and sketching and keeping a regular practice in a sketchbook, but it all needs to lead to something. So we wanna talk about how that process works and you know, what you're trying to say with your creative voice and you know, doing effective research is also a big part of that puzzle. Um, now, plagiarism. Now you were like, why would you put this in here? So this is very important. Um, when you get older and you are a junior or senior in high school and you're getting ready to put together your portfolio, um, maybe you're inspired by an image and you, you take an image off of Google Images and you copy. Um, that's how we learn how to draw. So that's okay. I learned how to draw by copying Marvel Comics, Jim Lee. And I would just copy it verbatim. I had a piece of tracing paper and then I would say like, look, mom, I drew this. And my mom would be like, yeah, did you draw that? I don't know. Um, so it's actually, uh, it's actually something where, you know, as I got older, we got older, it's good to be inspired. It's good to practice that. That is not something that you should probably put into your regular because it's not it's not original. You're you're just drawing somebody else's work. It's good to practice your skills that way, but you want to eventually kind of come up with your own style. And so when you're older, you want to make sure and you cite any resources that you use to create an art piece, just like you would if you were writing a paper for your English class. Okay. And so luckily with the internet, there's a lot of you know citation machines out there. So when the time comes. The tools are out there to make sure you, you give credit to the original artist if you use some of their work. And have any of y'all heard of Andy Warhol before? Okay, so Andy Warhol was really good at using or what we call appropriating images. Um, and it was later in his career where he actually you know, gave credit to the original artists that he borrowed photographs and, and illustrations and designs and labels from. So you just wanna be careful, make sure you're giving credit where credit's due and that's why I put that in there because it's a big part of creating a portfolio. All right, we can go to the next slide now. <laughs> um, so when we talk about the one of those three elements, the 25% is preparation. Um, and preparation is, is a fancy word for just saying art being ready. Um, and so what you wanna do is kind of follow some of these tips to make sure that your portfolio looks its best. And these are things, if you're, if you're getting putting together a portfolio maybe to get accepted to Dillard or one of these you know, magnet, magnet schools. Um, this is, these are good tips you can employ there too. Um, so whenever possible, if you have 2D image, we want you to scan them. Um, now, some people are like, well, I paint and I paint really big. I have like 18 by 24 canvas or even bigger. Well, I'll get a little insider tip. Uh, places like Home Depot, or not Home Depot, uh, Office Depot, um, FedEx, Kinko's, they actually have the ability to scan large scale 2D images. So it, they, they work with map makers and cartographers. So they actually have a wand scanner and they can go large scale scan um, if you have a really big painting that you wanted to, to submit for your portfolio. So that's a, that's a good tip. So you wanna to try to scan whenever possible. If you have to take pictures of your artwork, which has to happen sometimes, I recommend putting a couple of lamps on either side pointing at the piece at like 45 degree angles. So we got, there's both my hands right there. Um, so they, that, what, what that does is those contrasting light sources push the shadows out away from the piece and they help to limit some of the, some of the glare and some of the, um, the shadow effects you might get. So when you take pictures of your work, you wanna try to light it almost like that's the way a museum would light your, your painting as well, okay? Um, Whenever possible, try to use those higher resolution photos, uh, especially when you're uploading to a digital uh, portfolio option. Um, the reason for this is that, you know, people who are reviewing your portfolio, we want to be able to zoom in, we want to be able to go in and see the brushstrokes, see the minor details. 
Um, I'll tell you a fun story. We actually had a student from Korea who put together this beautiful painting. And it was a copy of uh, Hokusai's Wave. It, and I was like, oh, this is, this is really interesting. And they had built it out of matte paste. And so the little, little comment on the side was like, please take a closer look at the crest of the wave. So I zoomed in and there's a little window carved right under the foam of the crest of the wave. And there's a little person like looking out of the window. And my mind was blown. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, so, so make sure that you know, you're getting a high resolution image because if they hadn't have taken a high resolution image with good lighting, I might not have seen that. Um, and th that person is now at SCAD and they are, they are creating even more mind blowing things here in our, in our, our places. So make sure you get a high resolution photo. Uh, make sure you crop your images um, and cropping, you know, it's, every iPhone has the cropping feature. So I don't wanna hear any excuses. I, uh, I, have a, I love seeing portfolios come in. Sometimes I see your people's thumbs holding up the image as they're taking a picture of it. Sometimes I see the bedroom in the background. We don't want that messy clothes. The art room makes it makes an appearance. Um, so just crop your image all the way to the edge of the picture plane. I don't want to see binder rings from the sketchbook. I, I can usually tell if it's a sketch or not. So just be on the on the uh, on the lookout. You know, make sure it looks as best as it can before you submit it. Um, I want you to rotate images too. This is you know we're in the we're in well into the two uh, thousands here. So rotating an image is not a difficult digital procedure. Um, so we want to make sure that we do that as well, because again, uh, if it's meant to be seen like this, I don't want to have to find ways to look at it. Uh, make sure it looks the best you can possibly make it. Um, I mentioned that before with the Hokusai wave, but be sure to provide a brief little description. If they give you a caption box, you don't need to put war and peace in there. You don't have to write a whole book about your, your thing. But if there's anything that you really want the reviewer to take notice of, there's something you're very proud of in that particular piece, then I want you to make sure and put that in the, the comment box because that'll help us focus our attention where it needs. Um, and then of course, as I, I said before, make sure you cite any major resources, any images that you borrowed from the internet or you know, maybe uh, inspiration that you've directly taken from um, a, a major artist. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, a student does an exact copy of Van Gogh's Starry Night. So you need to cite that resource. I, Used Van Gogh's Starry Night from you know the museum, the Kratzel Home Museum. Um, uh, if you did Starry Night in spaghetti and meatballs, then that's inspired by, but very different. So that is okay. So inspiration, you could just say like this is inspired by Van Gogh's Starry Night. If you directly copy it, you need a site. Okay. Next slide. Right, this is the boring part. I promise. I'm moving fast through this. <laughs> okay. So these are the technique sides of things. So we talked about like things you've been learning ever since you started out in art. Um, these are little things that can help you to create a really successful piece of artwork. The first thing is a unique composition. As you look at us in our, our little Zoom picture frames here, we're all sitting in central composition. It's the composition that we're most accustomed to seeing. The problem is that too many people use it. And you can actually play around with space and form and uh, what we call negative and positive space. So some of you may have heard this before in your arts classes. So this is where it comes into play. So if I move over here, I don't know if you can see me, but if I'm, I'm over to the left now, I'm far away from my logo. So I've got a lot of negative space over here and I'm creating a lot of visual intrigue. You're like, what, what's going on there? It actually makes us look, and especially if it's a little bit unbalanced, it's kind of interesting. Um, but if I move over close to my logo, now I'm kind of crowding in this area and we've got a lot of activated space and a lot of negative space. So play around with that. Play around with like what I like to call the camera shot. If you're working with a painting or a drawing or, or photography, you know, change up your compositions um, and try to do it in a way that, that it draws emphasis to where you want, where you want the viewer to look or what, the, what message you're trying to say. So I'm going to show you some examples of it. Uh, later on in, in those SCAD challenge winners in both photography and in visual art. Um, and we'll talk about emphasis and, and using composition or using the layout of your picture frame um, to be able to make the story more interesting. Uh, color balance and value scale are also really important. Color balance is, you know, as you're looking at me, um, I am in kind of a 75-25 kind of thing. If you're looking at the slide, the slide is uh, 25% like activated darker colors like black text, you know, different rainbow uh, around the outside. And then 
we've got 75% kind of white surrounding. Um, pretty much everything you look at is 75-25 combination. If you're looking at yourself in the monitor right now, um, you know, oh, it's, you know, you're, if you've got the, the logo behind you, then you're probably 25, 25% activated space and 75% negative space. So think about that when you're putting together your work too, because you can use that negative space to draw attention to a particular element of your piece. So that's something to think about with, with color balance. You know, you're also working with the color wheel. Now, all of you have heard of complementary colors. So complementary colors actually make our brains happy. It's scientific fact. We are looking for the complements to colors all the time. And so um, I, I think nowhere more relevant than the NBA. Y'all are familiar with the Los Angeles Lakers. What's their color combination? That's violet and gold. Okay. What about the uh, what about the New York Knicks? Blue and orange. Uh, what about Christmas? Red and you know, red and green. So we're we're constantly looking for these color combinations, and that's where light and shadow hide too. Um, light and shadow hide in color combinations. If the color of light is yellow, then your shadows are going to be their root color is going to be violet. Um, so there's a whole science behind this that you'll be able to learn as you go to places like Dillard, and then you'll be able to really learn in depth when you you know after Dillard and going to places like SCAD where we've got professors who've like created a temperature color, all kinds of really cool stuff. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, but think about those color combinations. Anytime you can work the complementary colors into a picture plane, even if it's subtle, um, it's, gonna, it's gonna automatically make, make your brain happy. Don't do it all the time. Do it you know, subtly, like you know, a, little, a little bit goes a long way. But, um, it's something that can help you again to create a more successful art piece. Value scale is something that's really important too how light or how dark something is. We've all done these drawings where we've been leaning over the top of them. And we're drawing them for hours and they're like, oh, this looks amazing. But you gotta get up and you gotta step back from that drawing five or six feet and you gotta look at it because sometimes it's all just kind of gray. And you, by putting really, really dark darks and light lights and kind of playing around with your value contrast, you can make it even more exciting, more interesting. Um, and then, like I said, the rule of 75-25, it works with color, it works with value scale, it works with everything. And it was founded in the Renaissance. So again, when you all learn about art history, you're going to kind of learn about the golden section and the golden mean and uh, all the science that goes behind creating great artwork. So I won't launch into it here because I could go on for days about it. Um, but I'm just going to touch on it and I'm going to whet your appetite and then you're going to learn more about it. In the um, so we're also going to talk about the knowledge of perspective and anatomy. And we don't, you know, at the college level, we don't expect you to come in knowing exactly how to draw everything perfect when you're doing life drawing or how to make buildings perfect with three point or two point uh, perspective. But we, we want you to explore. We want you to, to take a shot at it. You know, I, I, like to, I like to give the benefit of the doubt to those students who really effort to put, you know, backgrounds in their pictures. And, you know, it's not just characters. They actually give them a world in which they exist. Um, it definitely helps with the overall appreciation and, and love of the, of the particular piece. So, um, you know, you're going to get some perspective. You're going to get some anatomy at, at, at these high school experiences. And then you're definitely, as, as our panelists will tell you, you're going to get a lot of experience with drawing from observation draw, and, uh, you know, doing a lot of um, uh, life drawing and, and perspective practice for sure. Um, so incorporate a little bit of that if you, if you want to. And there's some great tutorials online that you can also teach yourself how to do two point, three point, and one point perspective. And then last but not least, aerial perspective. Now we talked about linear perspective, but aerial perspective is also important. It's aerial perspective. The science behind this is, is there's actually air particles and air particles carry like that oxygen um, kind of uh, and hydrogen and the particles, the farther away they get, there's more and more particles. And so things look more blue and faded the farther away they get. And that's actually particles. There's so many particles between us and that mountain in the background that it's making it look blue and, and, and kind of faded. Um, so I think that's really cool. So it's through, the, um, it's through physics and it's through, the, uh, through optics, which is a branch of physics. Um, so if you're an artist, uh, you know, there's the STEM tie-in, like, you know, Check out physics. Physics is all about, you know, how our brains and our eyes and everything else work. Very exciting. Okay, next slide. <laughs> I promise there's visuals. This is the last one that's just words, okay? And you guys are like, we got this guy from SCAD and he's got no pictures. Um, okay, 
So visual art, uh, this is the most important thing though, and I, I definitely wanna stress this, your creative voice. Now, you can be as technically efficient as you wanna be. You can be as perfect with your presentation as you wanna be. And it's still gonna, it still might not be everything it could be. Art is a higher language. Art is, is communicating on a whole nother level. That's why we are so different from all these other species. Like we can communicate on a higher level because we're artists and we can, we can speak visually and we can speak through music and we can, you know, all these different, you know, new forms of language. Um, and so that is incorporating storytelling. It's incorporating your creative voice. It's incorporating your passion. Um, art can make you fall in love. It can make you completely disgusted. Um, it's, it's the whole range of emotions. And if it makes you feel something, then it's good. Um, you know, this, we're in an unprecedented time. The, the pandemic has been really, really hard. But you know what it's done? It's inspired us to create great art. And it's inspired us to get through this hard time. And so I want you to take advantage of this. You know, use, this, use your, your opinion and your, you know, your voice. We've gone through some other really terrible things, you know, in 2021, like in 20. We want, we use your voice as an artist and speak up and, and comment, on it. Um, comment with your work. Okay. Um, I want you to cop, I don't, I don't copy pre-existing work. That's number two. I put it in here a whole bunch of times. Don't do it. Don't play drugs. Um, successful pieces of art. Okay. There are a lot of different types of success in art. There's abstraction, there's, you know, there's representation, there's narrative. Um, a really good piece of art tells a story. It has a purpose. It evokes an emotional response of some sort. Maybe it's maybe it's memory. Maybe it unlocks our memory, you know. And and we have a photographer that will talk to you too. And sometimes the best photographs are are unplanned. You know, there's there's you know you can art direct a photograph and make it exactly perfect, exactly how you want it. But there's also a thing in photography called timing, um, and where you just capture that perfect moment that tells the story. It's that old saying like a picture is worth a thousand words. A successful piece of artwork tells a story that's worth a thousand words. So think about that as you're preparing pieces too. Um, you know, tell a story, make it, make it, you know, make it a commentary on what's going on. Um, and that kind of lead me, led me to my last little, little point there. All right, next slide, I have images for you now. I'm going to, um, I'm going to show you examples of drawing, painting, photography, sculpture, fashion, and graphic design. These are all winners from the SCAD challenge. Uh, which is our scholarship competition that we put on every year. So you would uh, submit your portfolio and then you could submit one piece of art to any of our categories in SCAD Challenge and increase your portfolio. So if you go to scad.edu forward slash SCAD Challenge, all one word, you can see some of our, our winners. So let's talk about this first piece by Haley Steigman. Okay, and we're gonna, we're gonna harken back to some of the things we talked about. So this is an incredible example of life drawing, drawing from observation. Um, and this is a really, really interesting piece. Everything is drawn perspective-wise, you know, um, pardon me, not perspective. Uh, basically, all of their life drawing components, their hands, their faces, their bodies are all proportional. Proportion is a big part of preparing successful artwork if you're drawing people. Um, this was done digitally, and I've seen more and more digital portfolios, and I'm encouraging digital work, but not in lieu of uh, doing the traditional practices. I want you to pick up a pencil first. I want you to, you know, suffer with the ink pot and everything before you go to the digital um, so that you appreciate it more. So this is an example of emphasis. So these boys are, are looking off to the side. Uh, this, it's telling us a story, you know. They're, they're set in the 1980s, which is me and some of your teachers are from that time period. So that's back when we played baseball with blue jeans and trucker caps. And, um, and they're actually kind of looking off to the left. And so that's creating visual intrigue. Um, their, their body language is creating visual intrigue. And then to draw our eye right where it's supposed to go, this artist chose to put that beautiful golden disc right behind, almost like a sun, right behind their faces. So even if we close our eyes and open them, we're automatically going right to their faces. And we're automatically asking ourselves, what are they looking at? It's creating intrigue. And so that's why this is a, is a really successful piece. And obviously the value scale is beautiful here. The color selection is beautiful. Um, you know, this is just a very successful piece of artwork. All right, let's look at another one. Next slide. 
Okay, so this is a completely different example. Um, this piece is actually done by Shannon Lee, and it is about, you know, what we're going through right now. You know, it's, it's, you're feeling like you're being pulled in a million different directions, almost like a string on an old sweater, and you're kind of unraveling. Um, and this artist chose to use paint, chose to use mixed media, um, actually made these little, these little beautiful origami cranes and tied them to pieces of thread that were, you know, woven into the actual painting. Um, so this is another really incredible example. It's very emotional. Um, we connect with this because we've all had to kind of struggle and, you know, and go through pain and um, hardship. And this one, this one won. And again, we've got that beautiful value contrast and emphasis. We've got really nice color balance, even though it's very subtle. Uh, we have, you know, that nice cool color mixed with the warm color. Um, and there's that visual element of the, the cranes hanging from the pieces, adding that much more visual intrigue to the, to the actual piece. And the, the student was very, very uh, smart with the way they displayed it. So they showed the piece in the, in the full to the left, and then they zoomed into more detailed work. And that's going to, I'm going to show you an example of the sculpture that did that work too. Um, but this is an example of a way to display your artwork like it's meant to be seen. Okay, and that's a big part of the, the presentation set of these. Okay, this is a still life. Oh, it's okay. Go to that one with the birds. Um, this is a still life. Um, this is a little bit disturbing, you know what I mean? But it is observational drawing. So even if you're making a still life, you know, it, you can make that still life of images from your childhood, objects from your childhood. Like, uh, you know, for me, it would be like a, a Cardinals baseball cap and a you know, and a, and a comic book and a, you know, um, a paint set or like one of those watercolor paint sets or something. So you can make it about anything, but make it intentional. Um, if you decide to do a still life, make it something that, that means something to you and that you think may mean something to others, and it'll be a little bit more successful. Now this is repulsive, it's like it scares me a little bit, you know? Um, these are scientifically cataloged birds that have passed on. Um, and the artist has shown to cut off part of the images. So it's creating visual tension over here on the left. And it's creating a sense of unease. The subject matter is creating a sense of unease. And the, you know, and they've done this on purpose because they want to evoke emotion. Sometimes, like I said, that emotion may not be, oh, this is beautiful. I love it. It's wonderful. It may also be like, yikes. Um, an emotion is an emotion. So, all right. Thank you. Next one. Okay, so here's some photography. This is one of the pieces that won this year. Again, things that we've, we've talked about, really interesting composition, interesting compositional layout. We've got the vertical composition, which remember the composition is the frame in which the action and the, the objects in the picture plane exist. We've got a lot of negative space, and then we have this halo around these two people, these two uh, you know, female figures, and they're standing in front of a car on a gravel road in the middle of the night, no stars, no nothing. And it's creating, again, it creates a sense of, of unease or intrigue or like what is going on here. Um, but really what's happening here is we've got some really beautiful value contrast and, and example of form. Um, and so uh, texture as well. Texture is a big part of photography and you know the, the juxtaposition of the, the texture, rough texture of the road, and then that completely you know, ink black texture of the night. Um, and that combination there. And so this image, again, might be a little bit, you know, disturbing, depending on how you interpret it, um, but it is it's making you think, and it's making you formulate a story in your head in that successful artwork. All right, let's see the next one. So here's one of my favorite photo pieces, and this makes, this makes me feel happy because it reminds me of camping. Um, so one of the great things about this beautiful black and white piece is again, the artist chose the perfect way to show what is happening. We have this beautiful, stark aluminum canoe, very little, it's catching all of the light, so it almost looks like it's glowing. It's against this river, and we've got this different texture of the current blowing past the canoe, the little ripples that the paddles are making. And I can almost hear it. Like if you look at a picture, like the, is this effective? You can almost hear it. Like I can hear the brook babbling and the, the paddles sloshing through the water. Um, and so much about art is finding that right timing. We mentioned timing before in that right moment. Um, and with photo, it's, it's also about like, if I could just walk up and pull out my phone and take a picture of it, it might not be as interesting as if, think about how this artist got this picture. They either had to like 
rig a drone to fly over just at the right time, or they had to like, I, I worry that they may have been like leaning over a ledge or something to get this picture hanging from a tree, maybe. Be careful with your, with your photo making and taking. Um, but it's adventurous and it's exciting. And, and, you know, I wonder, it's making me ask more questions. And sometimes the artwork makes us ask questions and it's successful. It's making us think. All right, next piece. So here's another example of great uh, emphasis. So we have color emphasis here. We have that beautiful blue crystalline color of the, of the pool and the repeating motif of those squares underneath it. Uh, we have uh, the yellow that is a 25% to the 75% blue, and that blue surrounds it. So the point of emphasis, we close our eyes, we open our eyes, we're always going to go to the kid on the third floor right there. Um, and so that's one of, the, one of the great things that you can do with photography is you can play with color, you can play with composition, you can play with the 75, 25 in the golden section as well. Um, it's a successful piece. Again, this person probably climbed the lifeguard tower or was on like the third floor taking a picture of, you know, of their, of their little brother or whatever in the pool. So um, it's a really, really interesting shot. Again, I'm not saying get in a dangerous situation with your camera. Just look at things in a way that nobody else is looking for. Okay, next slide. So here's some three-dimensional stuff. I know I have some great sculptors on the, on the call with us tonight. Um, this one is actually like one of my favorites and, and it's a student that has, has worked with metal. This is metal. Um, it's a, a, you know, aluminum chair. They've used some welding and it's meant to look like a um, roller coaster track. So if you look really closely, it looks like the roller coaster track going up. If any of you have ever been to Disney World and have been on uh, Expedition Everest when you get up to the top and the railroad tracks kind of split apart, this is sort of what it reminds me of. Um, but just, you know, I picked this piece because of the space that it activates, um, its sense of form, its sense of color. You've got that really strong red color. And then also, uh, I picked it because the, the way the artist has depicted it, the presentation. Look how they have put a, a gray backdrop up. They've lit it from multiple angles, so there's limited shadow and, and glare. Um, this is exactly how a museum might like this piece. And so I want you to think about that too. That, that is how you showcase the pieces as important. Well, not as important, but is very important element to success as an art, art piece. Okay, let's look at the next one. So this is another one. I love old, old timey medieval type stuff. And this is Beowulf. Um, and this, this student was evidently, Mason was, was reading Beowulf like we all do in senior or junior English class. And he decided like, I'm gonna go ham with my terracotta and like make this awesome. Um, and the way he did this, he actually has this really great uh, main shot from the top. And it's this low angle, like comic book superhero kind of pose, you know, it makes it look very epic. But because he made this in the round, it's meant to be seen in 360 degrees. So he also puts an inlay, um, and this is what I was talking about with using layouts in your presentation to accent your work and to make your work the best it could possibly look. He actually turned the thing in 360 degrees and we wouldn't have seen that amazing braid that he made on the back there. We wouldn't have seen the details, you know, from the, you know, the backside of that, that cool feathered shoulder pad and, and everything else. So that's important too, especially if you're working with 3D, the, the way you lay out your work, you know, you might, you might have one really good shot, but if there are other elements of that piece that we need to see, then you have to kind of be creative with your layouts. So that kind of falls into graphic design. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Speaking of graphic design, da -da -da -da, it's almost like I planned that. Um, so grab, <laughs> this is making my brain happy and I'm going to tell you why. Um, this is again, that color, color, uh, relationship that we talked about. This is complementary color. This is orange and blue, uh, working together. It's also really, really interesting topography, which is the art form of designing letters. Um, and it's just a beautiful layout. I like this vertical kind of representation of the map. This is, uh, over here on the right is actually what we call an infograph, which is a really huge part of the world of graphic design and it crosses over with my master's degree in design management and uh, infographics are the visual display of information you know utilizing both our our logical minds and our you know our our creative side of our brains to activate all of the all of the neurons so um, this this person did a really good job of making it clean and readable notice that like all the um, 
all the all the backgrounds to the letters are high contrast. So I don't have any trouble reading any of the letters, you know, and uh, that's that's a big part of it too. Uh, nothing's kind of resting against the edge and creating visual tension. Just a really nice layout. And so uh, graphic design is one of the most popular fields that you could potentially go into. There's so many jobs in like branding and um, being an art director and you know working in, working for magazines and newspapers and then there are moving graphic designers that, that they call it motion graphics and there's so many things that you can do. Um, but this is, that is why I think this piece is, is successful. This next piece, let's look at this next piece. Uh, so I don't know if any of y'all have been to Seattle before, Seattle, Washington, um, and it's on the other coast. Uh, <laughs> and so this is actually a fictitious festival uh, that this student's teacher set up and it was called the Seattle Woodsman's Festival. And they wanted to, the student to use, you know, different really unique styles of topography that they, that they used from, you know, the 1950s and 60s. And if you look really closely, this is a successful design because our highest value contrast comes along the teeth of the saw. And if you look closely at the teeth of the saw, it's the skyline of Seattle. So you can see the little the space needle there, uh, kind of about three quarters of the way down the saw. And so again, just a really, really brilliant, you know, use of design, putting two images together that you wouldn't think. Um, and a really limited color palette. This is only using red and white here. And so again, utilizing the negative space as well as the active space. So um, just uh, some more examples, like graphic design piece shows a lot of, you know, it shows a lot of ingenuity and in that you're thinking well beyond just your, your basics of the elements and principles of art. Only masters of elements and principles can wield graphic design. Isn't that right, Ms. Swanson? <laughs> um, all right, let's take a look at some fashion. Um, SCAD is known for fashion. We actually have the, the dean of the program is a 15 year vice president at um, SAC Avenue before coming to SCAD to lead our program. Um, this was a student that actually won and um, Ashton's work is, is very like fun. It's very like, you know, Generation Y, like it's, you know, let's get out into the world and, and explore. And um, it also has something that's really important to both graphic design and fashion and all the, all the world of design, and that's brand consistency. And that's a fancy way of saying like, everything looks like it belongs together, okay? The, the clothing designs, uh, they all look like they're from the same group, the same line, um, the same type of design, the same color palette. Um, and, you know, these students all look like, you know, I would wear this for fun. I wouldn't wear this to like, you know, um, to prom or anything like that. You know, these are, this is kind of like athleisure wear. Um, but it's cool because it looks like every piece of this particular advertisement, it's made, meant to be a print ad, they all look like they fit together. Okay. Now I'm going to show you the next one. It's going to be completely different. Okay. Let's look at the next one here. Okay. So this is an example of what we might see coming out of a, you know, more of a, um, a uh, professional kind of, you know, Europe, uh, Asia kind of fashion house. So this actually is, it was done by Yu Lu and she has actually interpreted her idea. The reason why this is really, really impressive is that she's interpreted her idea from 2D to 3D. Um, and she's kind of basically shown our, us her entire process here in this, in this one piece. So if you look really closely on the left, we have some hand-drawn, uh, fashion illustrations, or what we call croaky. So whenever you have like a little, learn something today. Whenever you have a little, you know, either faceless person or, you know, a little repeating person that you're drawing the clothing on, it's called the croaky. Um, and so these croakies have like these really beautiful designs, but you can see they all follow the same branding. They have a similar color palette. So they all look like they belong together in the same kind of fashion line. On the bottom there, even harder to see, I know the slide is a little small, I apologize. Um, but the, uh, you can see the flats, the flat uh, coloring. And then over here on the right, she took the one piece, the dress that we interpreted from, from 2D to 3D, and she actually broke down what the pattern looked like as well. And uh, our students do that now uh, because we use things like Gerber technology. So we actually have a digital pattern maker. Um, so it's really, really, really interesting. Um, then we see it not only fabricated or made, she sewed it, assembled it, put it all together, um, but she also put it on a model and put that model against a muted backdrop. So where's the emphasis, guys? It's all on the garment, it's all on the piece. So that's something to think about. Um, you know, that's preparation, that's carrying an idea through from 2D to 3D. 
and that shows incredible skill. Um, so if some of you are thinking about fashion and a way to, to kind of impress, this is, this is an example of a way to, to lay out fashion that might be a really cool thing. And you can get your friend who's a photographer to help you with the, with the photo shoot and the final looks and, and things of that nature. And that's gonna get you ready for the fashion industry um, because you've gotta collaborate with a lot of different people to make, to make uh, art and design happen. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just a few quick reminders. Uh, we're almost done, I promise. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to filibuster here. Um, just remember your cropping. Uh, remember to try to, to eliminate shadows and reflections. Um, crop out your binder rings. If you do put sketchbook work in, that's fine. Um, I just want you to make sure that you're presenting it in the best possible way. Um, think fingers and toes, keep those out of there. Uh, be careful with smudges. Make sure it looks, looks the part before you, before you take it to print. Um, and anything that's not intentional content, you don't want to draw attention away from what you want, what you want in the picture plane. Avoid cliches, okay? And even, even early on, going into, you know, you can, you can avoid these cliches. These are not a no-no. You can still have, have these in your portfolio, but by the time you get to college, you need to have worked it out of your system, okay? So eyeballs is the number one cliche in, in portfolios, okay? If you can't do an eyeball in a way that nobody has seen it before, maybe leave it out, okay? And all your art teachers are shaking their heads. They're like, please, like we've seen it so many ways. Um, okay, phone or kind of selfie type pics are, are, there's just not a lot of fun in that. There's not a lot of story in that. Um, flowers, we, if you can show me a flower in a way that I've never seen it before, um, that captures the, you know, the, the essence and the beauty of nature and, you know, or is super, mic super macro and we're zoomed way in and it looks like a whole nother world, then awesome. Otherwise, like you're, it's going to be, it may be wonderful. And I love, I love some flower pieces that I've seen. I love some pet pieces, there's pictures of babies or wedding pictures and things like that, but they're going to be, they're going to have a lot of company. Okay. Whereas like the student that went and took pictures of, you know, this amazing, like, you know, uh, what do I want to say? So one of the, one of the full tuition scholarships this year, they actually like did their research and found, um, this old boxing gym that had been closed down and it had been nobody had been in it for like, you know, like almost 20 years. And you got permission from the owner and, and went in and was taking pictures of the interior. And, you know, things were dilapidated and, you know, all falling apart, but it was sort of this vestige of a bygone era. And every piece in their portfolio after that was sort of a treaty on abandonment. And that was something special. Now, be careful, be very careful, you know, and when, when you're going out there and you're, you're taking some of these images, I don't want you to get in harm's way or anything, but think about looking at something in a way that nobody has ever seen it before. Um, you know, you have those moments every day, like you look down and you see this pattern on the ground, and you're like, there's something special about that, but then we, then we just move on, maybe take a picture of it, it might be your next portfolio piece. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Sunsets is another one we get a lot. I know, I know you're in Florida and the sunsets are beautiful. Put a couple in there and then, and then do some other things too. Um, make sure your work is finished. Um, we do have a policy and of course with COVID now we're, we're being a little bit more flexible. Uh, just be upfront and say like, hey, this is a work in progress piece, but I wanted to put it in here because I'm really proud of it. And I want you to mostly focus on the head of this, of this painting or something of that nature. Um, now, even more than ever, we've, we've, we need a little bit of care and a little bit of flexibility. So we need to be flexible. Um, and then don't plagiarize. There's your fifth warning for that. Um, okay, last one. Oh, next slide. Okay, so this is just a quick example of the SCAD portfolio review process. And I'm just going to kind of buzz through this. You would apply to your college. You'd be accepted. Um, and by sending us your transcripts, and then you would send us, put together your best artwork. We work through a company called Slide Room. So do other colleges like RISD and a few other places. I don't know if Parsons does Slide Room too, but I think most of our art schools do. Um, um, and this is just a place to upload your work and get it all organized. And then when you're ready, send it to the college. We get it in real time. I distribute it to our committee of faculty or an alumni, um, or sometimes I support the visual art pieces too. And we go through and give it a, you know, give it a score. We communicate that through um, our advising team, and then they communicate the scholarship outcomes to the student. Um, it is a pretty well-oiled machine, but um, 
I'm always up for a challenge. So uh, I want to see new things. I, that's why I'm, I'm so excited to get artwork from schools like Pillard, because you guys really push your students to, you know, to not only like, you know, have that technical proficiency, but to also have that creative voice and that originality. And that keeps me getting up in the morning. So I really appreciate that. All right, last slide here, I think is just my contact info. Oh, so these are the different portfolio types at SCAD. We do a visual art portfolio, just like most colleges, visual art being like photo film, or pardon me, film, excuse me, photo, drawing, painting, uh, sculpture. Uh, we also do, we also let you do film or animation or even sound engineering, sound design. So we'll do a hybrid portfolio. We accept a writing portfolio. So five to 15 pages of any type of writing. We have read some fan fiction that wasn't terrible. So you can submit that. Um, performing arts, you can do a monologues, contrasting monologues. Uh, you can also do a, one monologue with either a vocal solo, or if you're like a dancer, you could do like a solo uh, dance recital piece. Um, we even, uh, at our school, we're private and we write our own rules. We even allow an equestrian portfolio. So if, you, if you're a horseback rider that rides English style, you can submit an equestrian portfolio. So every school has different, I put this up here because every school has different portfolio requirements of what they're looking for. So the ultimately, when you get ready to go to college, do your research, look into those colleges. Some of these other students that went to Parsons and, and RISD and some of these other incredible schools as well, they have completely different portfolio requirements and standards. So do your research in each school. And what that does is it tells us that you care about our school. And so it makes us want to you know, give you the benefit of the doubt a lot. Okay, and then last slide I think is my contact information. So when you get to be an 11th grader or a 12th grader, um, you can screenshot this and I I've been doing portfolio feedback sessions individually with students that are getting ready to put together their SCAD portfolios and things like that. That's one of, one of the ways our college is, a, you know, is trying to make sure that we're keeping that humanity in our, in our recruitment process. So I will actually, me or one of the people from my committee will reach out and set up an appointment with a junior or senior in high school that's thinking about coming to SCAD. And we'll walk through your portfolio and we'll do a Zoom. And I actually do two or three with the students throughout the process just to kind of gauge how, how far along they're moving. Um, so, so save that for when you guys are finally finishing up your, your time at Dillard and, and you're looking forward to coming uh, to SCAD, okay? And what I want to do is just thank you all for your time, letting me just ramble on here. Um, hopefully some of it was entertaining. Um, I really enjoy being with fellow artists and inspiring newer generations of artists. And I hope you're able to take away a few, like, like uh, Mr. Oliver said, a few nuggets uh, from this presentation. Um, and thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Y'all have a great night. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Will. <laughs> we can give him a round of applause. Oh my gosh. Thank that you. Is thank you. A lot Great of information. Job. Thank you. It is a lot of information. And but also also I'll forward the you guys have my PowerPoint too. So feel free to share that with, with anybody okay. that requests. Great. And just, you know, this is where you want to go. If you want to get Emmys, we were just talking about the lady who designed the stuff for the Black Panther movie. You win all sorts of awards. So if you want to be a top artist, SCAT is definitely something that has to be on your radar. So Absolutely. All of you who are here, thank you so much, Will. And thank now you. we are going to introduce our alumni. We're going to start with Laura Panero. And um, Laura is going to talk to us about her experience at Dillard. And Mr. Joseph has a question as well once she talks about her experience. So there we go. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Lara Panero. Um, I graduated in 2016 from Dillard, and then I graduated recently in 2020 um, from Parsons School of Design. I came to Dillard my junior year with no portfolio, just a passion for photography. The year that I came in, I had the opportunity to work with Miss Stacy Jenkins, um, who was the 2D art graphics teacher. I came in and already entering her AP 2D art class, in which I was expected by the end of the year to have a completed portfolio to submit to the college board. My portfolio showed my range from abstract imagery to then portraits, um, learning, working with the principles and elements of design. Um, I chose to do an image of a series of images that documented the homeless. I worked at a church down in Pompano every Saturday in which I became their photographer. 
I had been constantly photographing to editing and then ch choosing what would be my 12 strong images that I would submit to the college board. Um, then, so that was my junior year. It was a lot of working around portfolio. Um, and then I got my senior year and my senior year was a little bit more calmer in the sense of, I already had a portfolio ready to go. Um, so with college applications, with contests coming up, exhibitions, scholarship applications, I had something to submit. Um, so at that point, I was just trying to get my portfolio and my name out there. Um, when it came to submitting to my Parsons application, I had to figure out what I was going to submit. So their, their application was, um, has like at, with every school is very particular. I had to submit an application um, with like all with a portfolio. And then I had to do a, what they call a Parsons challenge. I don't know how they go. Every year is very different. But at the time I had to submit, which would be three images that um, consisted of the same body of work and that would share um, a story at that point in which I had from my concentration of my portfolio from the previous year, I took three of my portraits and then I chose to um, tell each of their stories. Um, later on that year, I got my, my letter in which said that I got a full scholarship to Parsons. Um, Another point that I wanted to make is that I came in with a focus of photography, but however, I, it didn't mean that I couldn't explore other mediums, um, especially because Ms. Jenkins at the time would really push and try to explore um, collaging or um, um, manipulating images on Photoshop and even um, graphic design. And so all of those elements kind of helped me, prepare me to what would be my college experience. Um, and when we talk about portfolios, we talk about every single element. I think it's also important to talk about the fact that it's not, you're not going to deal with just to create a portfolio, but you're also learning um, the process of taking that portfolio and then taking it elsewhere and presenting and getting, showing your work. And that's like getting into shows that could lead you into getting scholarships. Um, it was, very, very interesting to do. Um, I think you are learning how to straighten the body of your work, really. Um, and all the teachers at Dillard, they're there to help you and give you the tools to push you to your fullest potential. Um, yet you also get a chance to learn about preparing your work for an exhibition um, from matting it, pricing it, and then naming your pieces. Um, those are all elements. Um, and you get a chance in your senior year to be part of a group show, um, one that will, you will help curate. Um, I think that was one of the greatest um, experiences because not only was I working hard on a portfolio and then I got to get all that experience from going into shows and how it was to enter and talk to people, but then I actually got to literally be the ones spackling um, the walls and preparing the walls to get the, the paintings hung. I think that all came together. Um, and last but not least, I had the most amazing three mentors, Mr. Celestian Joseph, um, Stacey Jenkins, and Miss Barbara Mazer. Today, I can say like, we talk a lot about those professors who will impact your life, who will change it for the better. And those truly are one, um, three people in my life that really um, became family. And thank you. Thank you to the other that I, oh, wow, it's emotional. <laughs> um, that I got the chance to get to where I am today. You know, I got to go to my dream school. I got to learn as much as I can from everything from the art world. So I'm very thankful and grateful. So, yes. <laughs> wow, Lara, thank you. Thank you for uh, bringing those tears to my eyes also. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's uh, really uh, humbling when you see your students leave you and they go off and they're building their lives and, uh, you know, 
with the three students you, you're uh, going to hear from today. You know, they're just amazing kids and just amazing people. So it warms my heart to hear you say uh, the things that you're saying, but also I appreciate uh, everything you've done and everything you've been. But I do have a question that I, I want you to uh, share uh, with the uh, students that are on today. Uh, having completed the arts programs at Dillard, what one piece of advice would you uh, give a student looking to attend either of the programs here at Dillard? I can't express enough is take advantage. Like you have some of the best mentors to guide you and teach you um, from the facilities and to just being able to create as much as you can because the, at this point it's you have the time. Um, and I would also say collaborate with your classmates. I think today I am really close with every single person that was in that class art classroom with me. And we're still trying to build our own community and like and within the art world. So I would say create as much as you can, engage and collaborate and just love to learn to love um, and love to learn. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, so I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sarah. Thank so you so much, Thank and you. it's so good to see you. Of course, and yes. <laughs> we're just so happy. And Amazing. our alumni come back all the time, but Lara has been to the school probably five times since she graduated, um, just helping everybody along the path because you're not an artist alone when you're at Dillard, you're a part of a whole artistic community with people from all around. So our next artist alumni that we have today is Mr. James Lee and St. Louis, and he is going to speak to us about his experience here at Dillard. Hey everyone. So as Ms. Swanson already said, I'm James Lee. I was a student at Dillard for all four years. I'm currently attending, well, I'm going to be attending Rhode Island School of Design in the fall. And firstly, I want to start off by following up on Laura's point about taking advantage of everything that is available to you at Dillard. Um, one thing that I cannot stress enough is to really be proactive in your education when it comes to making connections with not only your fellow students, but also with the teachers that you have. I was fortunate enough to have Mr. Joseph, Ms. Jenkins, and Ms. Black for the period of time that I was at Dillard. And they each taught me something different in respects to their own fields. And so I was very thankful for that as well. Um, and moving forward, I think something that a lot of students should go into school, well, Dillard, with is this idea of like, don't be afraid to fail. Because I feel like personally, I was very afraid to fail and like take risks when it came to like my work, not academically, but artistically. You shouldn't fail your academics, but definitely be, um, you know, def I definitely encourage everyone to take, be experimental with their work and definitely don't be afraid to fail. Moving forward, um, I want to talk a little bit about how Dillard has prepared me for post graduate life or post high school life. And um, one of the main things for me was being able to go to an institution that I felt comfortable with and that would, you know, really help me to grow as an artist because everyone's path is different, but I chose to go into, um, I chose to go into an art field. And so when I was applying to colleges, I applied to a whole lot. Um, but one thing that I made sure to do when curating my portfolio was to research the school and what the school was about and and um, reaching out to former alum because it's very easy with social media to like access people through different channels and like researching about the school and what it is that I wanted to put into my portfolio to showcase my range of skills my specialties what have you with whatever it may be and be mindful of the things that you're putting into a portfolio because at the end of the day, your portfolio speaks to who you are as an individual and you're doing your best to give them a glimpse at what you're capable of, but also what's important to you or what you may be interested in. Even if you don't know in the moment, it's still important to be mindful of that. And as a result of my efforts and things like that, I was um, fortunate enough to have been given a full ride scholarship similar to Laura at RISD. And I'm immensely thankful for all the lessons and the support and the guidance that my teachers have given me as a result of, you know, just being there all my four years and like having the insight to like, you know, do the best thing possible for me. Because one thing that I want every student to have is the opportunity and the option to choose the institution and not let money be the deciding factor on where you go. Because the reality is um, 
money may be a big issue for everyone, but I I want art students, especially to, to have the you know the resources to allow them to grow and be successful in whatever departments or whatever field they may be interested in. Because the reality is, as long as you have resources, then you'll be able to do what you need to do. But yeah, thank you. Hey, that's awesome, James Lee. It looks like you answered most of my questions just in your response alone, but I do want to uh, ask you a uh, an additional question on top of that because uh, you know you've built an entire portfolio, you've gotten accepted into uh, the college of your dreams, and uh, you know you you work extremely hard to get there. But when you when you look back and you uh, think about your experience, is there anything in specific? Uh, that comes to mind in terms of what these guys should uh, hone in on when they're uh, putting together their portfolio that would be very beneficial to them because everyone's experience is a little bit different. And I'm sure uh, for you, it was different from most of the other students in your uh, you know, graduating class. But is there anything that you see that these guys may not see on the horizon right now as young people who are also looking to pursue a career? Yeah, um, like I said, the biggest thing for me when I was making my portfolio was I had, I was very afraid to experiment. And that's something that I'm still challenging myself with right now is like this idea of getting out of your comfort zone. And I really want to stress the students coming to school, like this opportunity that you have to even go to Dillard is to give you the time to experiment and to try new things and to challenge yourself. Do not be afraid to challenge yourself. It's, you know, Joseph and I, um, Mr. Joseph and I talk a lot about, well, you'll come to know that the grading system and things like that, he's very rigorous, but the thing is, he knows everyone's capabilities, and the reason why he's very on top of things is because he knows everyone has the capability to do better and be better and to show, you know, new aspects of themselves, and so my biggest advice to you is to have a purpose when you create work and don't just make a piece because it looks good, but like have a reason behind it and to have that reason challenge you in whatever way it may be narratively, artistically, compositionally, whatever that may be, just challenge yourself. And that'll show so much at the end of your career, at the end of your time at Dillard because you'll have a better portfolio for it. Wow, amazing. Thank you, James Lee. And, you know, I just think, I just, keep hearing you guys uh, speak. And I just remember when you guys came in as freshmen into our program and it, you know, you guys were, you know, cautious, you were afraid, you weren't sure about where you, where you were heading with all of this uh, ability that you have. And it's just amazing to see you guys now. I mean, I just listen to them talk about their artwork and talk about their experience and I'm just blown away. I mean, these are amazing people, you know, that uh, come out of the program. So thank you. And that's uh, so that important, Mr. Joseph, because um, the kids here, the alumni, the graduates, the work at SCAD, um, you all may be a little intimidated by the quality of that work. That is not what we expect for you coming in as an eighth grader with any of that. We just expect you to aspire to that to grow. So don't see all that work and then just shut down because if you have it in you, definitely just keep growing yourself as an artist. And James Lee did um, forget to mention that he is a Silver Knight Award winner for art. So if you wanna look up the at the Miami Herald, you can see his uh, amazing portfolio. He started a nonprofit organization, all sorts of cool things. So our kids are cool, not just with the work they produce, but they're just cool inside their heart. And then they just let it all come out. So thank you so much. And now we have our final alumni for tonight, Alexia Jones, who also just graduated. And while we're speaking of awards, in case she doesn't mention, she's also um, on the robotics team and always will be, you'll never leave. <laughs> um, she did win an award um, at the national competition for best robot design. So she took all of her 3D work she did with Miss Black. She was able to translate it into a digital media and she was able to get recognized um, in the industrial area for engineering design. So that's just cool in and of <laughs> itself. And your skills in art will take you anywhere you want to go. You just, you just work, do the work. So now we have Miss Alexia Jones. Uh, hello, my name is Alexia. Um, and as Miss Swanson said, I was in the robotics team 
But um, as tonight is art related, I want to talk about my experiences at Dillard. Um, I may not go to an art school like the other two, but I will say that Dillard has made me appreciate art in a way that I never imagined I would before. Um, it's made it so that it's much more a part of me and um, Mr. Joseph and Ms. Black, um, they are really there just to help you learn as best as you can and push yourself further. Um, I would like to say that even though I don't go in, to an art school or that I don't pursue an art major, um, I don't regret making my portfolio at all. I don't regret the experiences I have at Dillard because as Ms. Swanson said, they can translate over into other areas of their life and um, they can really help you grow as a person. So uh, I'm really grateful for my experience at Dillard. Hey, Alexia. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have a question for you as well. So you're studying engineering at UCF, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you uh, let the uh, folks who are on tonight uh, understand and know how some of the rigor of the magnet programs prepared you for your uh, challenging studies that you're taking on right now? Can mm -hmm. just elaborate on that a little bit for everyone? All right. So um, all four years at Dillard, I've taken the AP exams and Doing the work for those exams is no joke. Um, <laughs> juggling, <laughs> juggling the work, uh, drawing every day in school and outside of school, um, along with keeping up A's in your classes. It's, it's really something that I'm grateful for, although I may have been frustrated at the time, because going to college, I know that I have experience with that kind of workload and that I can adjust to it easier. Um, it's still harder in college, but the experiences I got at Dillard with that really helped me to prepare and um, have a, an idea of what I should be doing and how I should handle deadlines and stuff like that. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. That's awesome. One of the things we try to prepare all of our students for uh, coming into our programs is, uh, you know, they're coming in as freshmen into a high school, but a lot of times what we're not, what we're envisioning is not them as high school students. A lot of times is, you know, we're envisioning them as college students. So uh, in order for them to, you know, make that leap to the next step, a lot of the work that they will do with us is college-based. And so you'll see these guys working just diligently, constantly on all sorts of uh, work, not only academically, but also artistically. So. Uh, you know, and these three uh, students that uh, just shared tonight are just some of the best of the best that we've had come through our program. And these are just a few of many that have come through the program. So you guys are uh, really blessed to have them uh, come in tonight and share their experiences with you because this isn't something that's unique to just them, but a lot of the students coming through the programs are also receiving the same benefits. So. Uh, thank you, all three of you guys. Really appreciate you. So, thank you. Definitely. And now we're going to um, have Mr. Joe continue on with um, art, uh, art as a career and different careers. And then we will have Mr. Thompson uh, jump on with uh, the um, career outlook. So that is great. And James Lee is sharing his um, portfolio and Instagram and all that if you wanna see some of his work, but feel free to ask questions of the alum or us in the chat and let's get this party started. All right, so right. Let's... <laughs> Sam, so if you can bring up the uh, slides. So is this a... Uh... We'll just go next. Next on to this one. All right, artist career outlooks, everyone. So uh, there are a lot of careers involved with the fine arts. And what I'd like to do is share some of this uh, with you guys this evening. Next slide. So back in 2009, Ringling College of Art and Design uh, put on a series of posters 
that basically forecasted the artist career outlook in the coming years. Next slide. And they found that 84 billion in revenue will be generated in the film and entertainment industry in 2009 through 2013. This would be from things like short films to feature films, to TV commercials, to webisodes. Uh, there will always be a demand for moving pictures and creative professionals to write them, direct them, edit them, produce them, and most importantly, sell them. A visual arts degree can help you to become part of the largest economy in the world. Next slide. Uh, their data also found that the creative sector would be worth $6.1 trillion internationally in less than 15 years. That's a lot of money. Needless to say, the creative sector has far surpassed that number today. The starving artist myth is quickly being replaced with the thriving artist. And according to analyst John Hawkins, in 15 years, the creative sector will be the largest economy in the world. It's no surprise. Visual art is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. Next slide. There are 2.8 million Americans that work in the visual arts industry. There are nearly 3 million, uh, 3 million artists in a gazillion different professions fulfilling their dreams in the visual arts industry, but it's not as crowded as most people might think. In fact, visual arts is one of the fastest growing industries in the world, from careers in graphic design, animation, illustration, and more. You too can join the largest economy in the world with a visual arts degree. Next slide. So what can you do with an art and design degree, you might be asking? Well, there are many available options. Let's quickly take a look at the many at many of these different options that are available. Next slide. From business of art and design to computer animation, there are many, many career paths that can be taken from creative writing to entertainment design. Film, multiple options, the fine arts degrees that are available, game art, lots of you guys love playing games, so many different opportunities available to you. Graphic design, which is loaded with careers, and it goes on and on, illustration, so many careers jam-packed into there as well. Motion design, which is a very popular career choice. Photography and imaging, so much involved. Virtual reality development, many options there, as well as visual studies. And then I'll pass it off to Ms. Swanson to cover the creative uh, economy. Thank you so much. And now we have Mr. Thompson here. If you're still on, Mr. Thompson, here are your slides. I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. Thank there you. Oh, great. So, so the creative economy. Can I get the next slide for me? So the U.S. Bureau of Labor for fine artists, including painters, sculptors, and illustrators. So again, as we mentioned before, the starving artist is dying very quickly. A fine artist from ranging from illustrations to comics to film to animation, art directors who lead these jobs and control how the projects are started and finished, the art and design workers for the people who work on every little tiny detail from the brush strokes to the woven patterns inside your costumes, and then everybody who captures the action with the motion picture and video, the lighting, the detail, the architecture. All these people make, well, most of them make well over six figures. That's not starving artist anymore. That is that is living pretty well. So parents, if your student or your child is like, hey, I want to be an artist, don't stop them. Let them let them grow. Next slide for me, please. 
So 71% of Americans are using electronic media to connect and connect with art and design. We live in the digital age. We have social media, we have YouTube, we have people making stick figures. We're not, we're not even talking the brilliant piece that we've seen from our alumni or going to SCAD. We're talking regular cartoons that people are just enjoying just out of entertainment alone. And it's all shared through a phone or just an access to a free website that your student can participate in. And generating tons of content, generating tons of an, billions of people for an audience. And all this can start right here in sixth grade at Dillard High. You yeah. can start at six, you can start at ninth grade. It doesn't matter. You're building your portfolio so that you have access to all of these opportunities. So you can practice, get your audience ready, and that boosts your, your relevance. And you can go to these art shows and be like, hey, I know that kid. He did so-and-so. She did so-and-so. And then you can say, hey, Scat, I did this. Look, people love me already. Right? You can go to UCF. I'm a fellow UCF alumni. I've done all my art from different projects and stuff, and it helped me get into school as well. You have the creative industries making over or almost 700 billion. Apple, Apple commercials probably make a quarter of that by themselves. Disney, as we all know, Cartoon Network, Warner Brothers, CNN, all those, every part of those careers could be one of you guys. Either it can be the main character of the show, it can be the third, the third, um, what is it called? The, when it slides across the screen, the third reel, something like that. I forgot which one what it's called, but it could be any one of those things. It could be the simple animation, the credits, all of these parts are controlled by how you guys get in and create. We have 400% um, of the people playing video games from our cell phones to consoles to PCs, YouTubers streaming content. We have $200 billion worth in advertising, the Super Bowl, the NBA finals, um, campaigns for politicians. All of these things are things that you guys create. Let's see what else. Um, 1.63 trillion for the GPD and software films. So even if you're not like the artist, again, that's creating the main topic or the main subject, you can design UI interfaces for things like Elon Musk and his cars or for Google or again, Apple, their easy interface that everybody loves so much or a little Android interface as well for the Android Samsung phones. Um, you have, what's another good topic? 600,000 employees as designers. They didn't even specify which ones. They just says designers. You can design comic books. You can design movies. You can design the instructions that go inside your mom's fridge. These are all jobs that we control. So don't be afraid. And if you get into one, that puts your foot into the next one. Say you get in as the designer for the instruction manual. Now you're a designer for the game manual. Now you're saying, hey, I designed this. I can decide to design for the next big social media platform. And then you take that ability, you go to film, and then you go from film to animation, and animation to games, and it just keeps going back in a cycle. And that's how you keep your jobs. So with all these avenues to jump in, you can start off early. You can get seen early. You can practice here with us at Dillard early and become amazing by the time you graduate. So don't be afraid. Next slide. So some of the things that we offer at our school for the fine art side, we have AP drawing portfolio, we have AP 2D art and design portfolio, AP 3D art design portfolio, AP art history, art history honors, drawing honors, sculpture honors, pottery honors, and arts collaboration. On the digital art side, we have digital arts one through three, honors for illust art illustration, layout and graphic design, and artistic expression. You have AP 2D art and design digital edge. You have visual tech one, two, and three. I teach those personally. You have film one, two, and three. You have game design, CAD design, which is to be more specific, it's 3D design for tools and robots and architecture and things like that. So if you want to wear, then you have the ACE media and the ACE art and design, which I believe, Ms. Swanson, if you can help me out, aren't those related to our Cambridge courses? Right. So we have AP and Cambridge, two scholarly college level course tracks, you can say, that can just open up avenues to success. And then we have photography. And I think that's it at the bottom. I'm not sure. Is that it? That looks like it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Now we go to Ms. Black. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. No problem. Hey, everyone. So um, all the students, um, art students at Dillard, 
uh, have an opportunity to take AP and honors art history. This will build uh, you as, a, as an art student, a tremendous understanding of art across different periods, societies, cultures, uh, ultimately um, making you very brilliant and also strengthening your own artwork. Um, AP Art History has the potential of a highly rewarding class that you will just uh, expand your mind about the world as, as a whole. And um, it's, it's just a, it's a great opportunity for you. So that's available. Next slide. But I also want to talk to you about um, drawing. And um, this is probably the single most important thing that you could be doing right now to improve your uh, skills as an artist. So drawing from direct observation. So if you are in middle school or elementary school and you wanna get ready for this program, the best thing for you to do is to draw, draw, draw from direct observation. And what does this mean? It means drawing what you see. It's as simple and as complicated as that. It could be a flower, a tree, a still life, a landscape, any object, your foot. I tell people that all the time. If you can't find something to draw, draw your foot. But it's drawing what you see in front of you as realistically and as true to life as possible. This is the most important activity you can do to become a good artist. Direct observational drawing is not drawing from your imagination, okay, or characters you like. It is drawing what you see around you. So we really, really, really want you to start doing that today. The more you do direct observational drawing, the better you will become as an artist. Okay, next slide. Here's some examples. Uh, several kinds of examples, you know, you can draw your lunch, you can draw your silverware, you can draw your shoe, anything. You can also do digital drawings. Next. All right. As an artist, you need a body of artwork in your portfolio. So We've talked about portfolios quite a lot tonight. What is a portfolio? It is a collection of your artwork made by you. And that is what we want you to start building on now. And we are also going to help you with as a student at Dillard. Okay. So at Dillard, we're here to help you build this portfolio. You're gonna get Lots of experience drawing still lifes. You're going to be able to do landscapes. You're going to do self portraits. You're going to do figure drawing. You'll do abstract art. You'll do 3D sculpture and design, photographs, animation, video, 3D digital drawing. You'll get a wide range of opportunities to build a very dynamic portfolio. Okay. Thank you so much. And now we have uh, Ms. Dion. Hi there, everyone. So we're going to talk just briefly about what these things are that Mrs. Black was saying we need to have in our portfolios. So what is a still life? We saw one at the very beginning from Mr. O'Donnell from SCAD, which was very interesting with the birds. What we typically see, though, are just everyday objects set in a group. So the images that you're seeing on your screen are just things around the house. And one of the things that you could you can do to improve your drawing, like Mrs. Black was saying, is drawing things that you are seeing. And still life is going to be the place where you're doing that. You're, there are so many different ways to practice that. But putting just two or three things together and practicing those things is going to create a still life for you. And you can practice all kinds of drawing and painting techniques doing those. Next slide. What is a landscape? Uh, landscape is my favorite thing to work with actually aside from people. 
And a landscape is really anything outside. It can be a short little area of space. It can be a wide area of space. You can do it with all kinds of different materials. And what we've put here for you is just to say that the focus of the artwork is the natural scenery, mountains, forests, backyards, oceans, whatever is near you, your backyard. You know, you sit in the backyard, you can choose a small little area or you can choose to do a large scope area. Next slide. What is a self portrait? This is a complicated answer. It could just be what you're seeing here, a realistic version of yourself. And that is something that we practice here, a lot of realistic drawing. Again, this is drawing something that you're seeing, whether you're sitting in front of a mirror or you're looking at a close-up photograph to get the details of your eye down. You are doing a portrait of yourself. So it's a drawing, it's a painting, it's a photograph, it could be digital, where you've played around with the background, you're adding and adjusting reality and it's something done by you of you. It might be realistic, like these three faces you're seeing here, but it could be a little more abstract. It could be not so real looking. Next slide. What is a human full figure drawing? Well, we were just talking about a self-portrait and that is a section of the full figure, but what we really learn and what we're gonna practice for full figure is a lot harder than that. It's the whole body. It's getting the legs in there, getting the arms, getting the angles. That one that you're looking at all the way on the left is fairly basic and that's what we're expecting you to start with. This is where we all start. We start with a stick figure and then we put clothes on it, right? And then we add to it and we put the bodies in positions and we practice drawing them at different angles. A human full figure drawing is the drawing of the entire person doing whatever. Next slide. I've mentioned the word abstract a couple times and the word realistic. When we hear the word realistic, we sort of already know what real life is supposed to look like. Abstract artwork is taking that real life and messing with it. Abstract art is when it's not trying to make it look exactly the way it should. And even just changing a few colors around in a self-portrait is gonna make it a little bit abstract or you can go all the way to where you can't even tell what it is that you're working with subject wise and you're working with just the basic elements of art, lines, shapes, colors, changing those values and you're messing around with your composition instead of thinking about trying to make something look the way it does in real life, a realistic piece and direct observation. Maybe you take that realistic piece once you've gotten it down and you mess with it and you end up with something abstract. So that could mean that you change the colors and shapes, all of those types of things. A sculpture, our examples here that you're looking at are paper, a wood sculpture, a little cardboard sculpture, and a little clay guy. We also work with pottery here at Dillard. You'll be hand building more, like, more than likely with Mrs. Black, perhaps with myself but we can work with any materials that are not flat and that is called a sculpture. When you are working not on a flat surface and you are popping that object up to be, have space around it, maybe it's not just from the front. Most of the time you're looking around all the way around the whole thing. Sometimes we just pop up a little bit. Any of those kinds of things that stick out at you and use the space, those are gonna be called sculptures, three-dimensional artworks. Next slide. Hey everyone, uh, this is Mr. Lopez. Uh, so here uh, in the digital art realm, uh, we work with 3D models. So 3D models are basically using mathematical points in space on a computer and creating an, either an object or an environment or an environment full of objects that are created from these points. And so using that, we can create characters or furniture or rooms uh, and we can, we can animate those characters or we can even uh, 3D print them to use them in the real world. So what you make on the computer then can become a real life object. We also cover film, which uh, we cover all aspects of film. So we go from taking, learning about the camera, learning how to get uh, different shots and storyboarding and preparing for your film. We, we, we cover uh, filming on location, uh, getting actors, setting up your scenes, uh, making sure your lighting is correct. And then we even get into post-production where everything is either edited or you do your sound production. 
um, as well as special effects that are applied to your film at a later time. So we have the full production cycle of creating your own personal film. We also have animation, which uh, we do uh, a wide number of forms of animation. So we do traditional flipbook animation, as you see in some of the pictures here. Uh, we have characters that you design, and then we take those characters and you, we teach you how to make them come alive. We also cover um, motion design or motion graphics, as they call it, uh, where we can actually create uh, designs that are used for advertising or digital media, as well as uh, mainstream media that you see on television. We also cover photography, which uh, covers uh, the, the different forms of light and recording light, both in black and white, as well as color. Uh, we, we talk about composition, as well as framing and your figure, uh, and also uh, implementing texture as well as your development of your film, either digital or physical. All right. So you guys have all been busy listening to us explain lots of amazing things that you can do to uh, show your creativity. So at this point, we would like for you to take about five minutes or so to uh, show us a little bit of your creativity tonight. So take a look at the examples here on the uh, left side here. And what we'd like you to do is uh, take about five minutes and create your own unique drawing uh, using a number of your choice between one and 10. And you may use any material, pencil, pen, marker, colored pencil, uh, any sort of a digital drawing device, et cetera that's available to you and any size paper of your choice and just have a little fun uh, and just draw uh, something and, you know, make it fun and get creative. And uh, Miss Dion will explain to you shortly how you can send that uh, creative little drawing that you've made over to us so we can take a look at how creative some of you guys are this evening. So just take a little time and uh, Find something to uh, you know gather and uh, get that together so you can draw something creative and send over to us, okay? Okay, what we've created for you is a canvas page that sums up everything you've heard tonight and has additional information about the specific requirements for applying here at Dillard and what you would need to put in that portfolio. You've seen and heard a lot of things this evening. It's not all gonna stick, but it is in one place for you to find it. So what you're gonna do is take a peek in the chat right now, if you'd like to. I have copied and pasted a link in the chat for in the Zoom. And you can also see it on your screen here. There's a Canvas page that has a little mini welcome just to say hi, and we're so excited that you're interested in pursuing your portfolio and getting some feedback from us. So this place is a place where you can go and check out our two assignments. One of them is the creativity challenge. So when you go and you enroll in our Canvas page, you will see that you have a little welcome message. And on the left side, you are able to be, uh, you're able to click on the portfolio day creativity challenge and also give us some submissions into the fine arts portfolio assignment. I'm gonna give, uh, give that link a check. I see that it's not working for someone here. Uh, we're gonna put that in here in a different way, but we've created this for you so that you can go into it after this evening and it will have in it the recording of this, this evening's act activities, all of us speaking and the PDF that we've used for our slideshow this evening. So you'll be able to submit onto this Canvas page and you'll be able to get some feedback from some of your art teachers and all of us here at Dillard see this and can respond to you in it. So we'll spend a little bit of time right now making sure that that works for you and I'll repost in just a moment. All right, and right here we have Mr. Charles. He's gonna tell us a little bit how to join us here at Dillard High School. 
Yeah, and thank you guys for staying in there with us. I hope you've gotten some tremendous information uh, through this, and we want to engage with you to help you further develop. And should you find that you're interested in spending more time with us and being on our campus every day, you can go to our website at bribeschools.com slash Dillard High. And we have plenty of information on how to apply for our program. And uh, as a matter of fact, our next application window opens on May 3rd. And you'll be able to go to that home uh, page as well. Click on the apply links and you can be a part of our amazing award-winning program. In addition, you can find contact information at our website also, but as this is going to be recorded, we will have this as a part of that, uh, those con this contact slide will be available for you in case you're not able to get this information as you see it right now. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to be in further contact with you subsequently to share this contact information with you also. So you will have this information. You can reach out to us through the website. You can always join the Canvas and be a part of that and submit any questions that you may have. And you can reach any of us through that particular matter also. So we just wanna make sure we're as accessible as possible to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Charles, and thank you, everybody. This has just been a great night, and I think that you guys have all learned something, but there's a lot of information here, and this is now one of my favorite parts. This is a picture of um, one of our senior art shows from like two years ago, and right now we'd like to, you guys can open your mic, type in the chat, but if you have any questions for any of us here, just let us know. So now's Now's the time you guys get to share with us. There's some art teachers on here. If you guys have any questions or any students who are able to stay with us, we went a little bit over what we were planning. However, um, definitely we have things. Um, Aisha, you have any questions? No, no. You can always- Giving you lots to think about tonight. <laughs> that means the presentation was so amazing and thorough. All questions have already been answered. I think that's- what Absolutely, that must be, that must be it. I did read in the chat. Uh, the first link is meant for current Canvas users. Students that are already in Canvas can click on that. But if you're not someone that's familiar with the platform of Canvas, you can use the second link in there and register and then join with the code. That's so cool. Thank you for all your work with the Canvas page. You, uh, Ms. Dion and Ms. DePuzo working to, to get that there. We're just so happy. Shamaya, do you have a, what do you do, Shamaya? What grade are you in? I'm in 10. Okay, cool. Are you here at Dillard? No? no. But you want to be an artist? What kind of art do you do? Mainly digital. Cool. Check out our stuff. If you want an in-person tour, you know, we do those social distance style, you know, but that's even better for you because that's one-on-one -on -one and we take you around the campus, so. Send us some of your things. Yeah. Head to the Canvas page and, and send us some of the things that you guys have got at home. Uh, it's not easy always to share, but this comes directly to all of us and we can give you feedback and we'd love to see what you guys have already. And then we can give you some little pointers. Oh, good. Aisha has a good point. We talked a lot about the older um, students, but we start in sixth grade. Um, in sixth grade, we start with digital art. Our magnet is um, digital entrepreneurship. So you have to know how to run a business. So part of that is also the art involved with that. But we also have Miss Dion has a sixth grade um, traditional fine arts media as well. So you would take, you know, the three classes, digital art, media, and traditional media and um, business. And you would have that, but definitely we invited all of you guys there to come. So Aisha, 
come see, have your parents come see, they can call me and we'll do that. Um, I also want to make one uh, mention because I know we also have some uh, fifth graders uh, uh, on, on tonight. I know uh, for a lot of you guys, when you start to think about some of your uh, middle school choices, you may not have many middle school choices available to you. And one of the things I would strongly recommend to you guys at your uh, age level and your uh, grade is to try to get into any sort of a summer program or any sort of an art workshop that might be available to you guys so you can continue to pursue your passion, okay? Uh, eventually, you will be in a high school setting and any of those types of uh, experiences will be very beneficial to what you're doing at your young age. Because uh, I know that a lot of the middle school programs may not necessarily have art or carry art, but you need to go ahead and continue to uh, pursue those experiences so you can develop your skills. So by the time you do make it to a program like our school and our types of program, you're uh, ready. Okay, so because I saw a uh, post in the chat about what was possible for some of our uh, elementary age kids. So. Thank you for that person posting that. And also, if you guys are not interested in digital at all, because our middle school magnet is digital entrepreneurship, my really good friend, Miss George, is at Parkway. She has the school of the art for um, traditional media. And Aisha is showing us her stuff. That's all yeah. I want to see. I'm like, wait. <laughs> she is Beautiful. so great. Can, can she come now? Can we open a fifth grade? Just get her over now. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Is yep. she, she's fifth grade now and gonna be, she's gonna be sixth grade next year, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, we got room for. All right. Hey, so you have our contact information. You email us, talk to your parents, see what works for you and we'll work out whatever thing you need. But yeah, if you're showing us work already, we are so happy to have you. Yeah. And Elena, um, did you have anything you wanted to say? I see you there, you might be a teacher. Sorry for calling people out, I'm just like, there. And let me see, did we answer everything in the chat? Um, Praise and Keila went here for the music program. So what are your chances of getting into the art program? If you have a portfolio that meets all the requirements, we're gonna work with you. We just, um, we need to see that you, uh, Mr. Charles, you wanna, I mean, if you're talking about the fine arts program, you wanna explain that with digital art, you have the test scores, you're in. So we get that, we take you as a non-artist, or an artist and we build you up to this amazing person. Every single one of the alumni you saw did graduate. Aisha does have more work. She, oh, oh look at that. Wow. Aisha is auditioning right now. She's Hi, auditioning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that means that I get seriousness. to see you next year in my intro two-dimensional classes, right? If you get that portfolio together, let's do this. Yeah. Come on. So a quick I question. Wanna, I want to speak to uh, praise there, and I, I think um, I'm assuming that uh, uh, the Keela that was in our commercial music program, who, by the way, is doing phenomenal in the music business right now. I mean, she's she's really doing well. And I just want to let you know that the same type of experience where she was able to grow in the capacity that she did is what you can expect in our visual arts department. And if uh, I hope I'm not embarrassing myself because I think I know the family and the father is a graphic designer, it does fabulous work. So uh, this would be right in your wheelhouse, uh, praise if I'm talking to the right person. Even if it's not your family, it's still in the right place. So you got to come and join us anyway. Is, Miss, uh, is Kyle Harris still with us? And I, I thought we, uh, if, if so, Kyle has a, uh, a, a summer program that's really wonderful that um, Mr. Mr. Joseph, do you remember what the name of her studio is? It's Harris Art Studio. 
Okay. Harris Art Studio. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Harris Art Studio in Hollywood. And uh, we can certainly put any student in contact with Ms. Harris if they reach out to myself uh, or even if they reach out to anyone on the, on the uh, call tonight and you forward that information to me, I'll make sure anyone that wants to learn more about her summer art program uh, could get the appropriate information. Yeah. Looks like uh, Ms. Swanson, Danny has a question. Danny W has uh, their hand up and they may have a question. Good, all right. Danny, did you wanna chat or just open up your mic? Danny's mic might be having a problem. Yeah. Can you hear me on here? Yes. Um, so it's not letting me like register to the Canvas program. Are you in Broward Schools or? Yes. Okay. It should. So we're gonna send a link out to everybody. We'll we'll certainly fix all that soon. I think Miss Dion is like jumping on right now. I am. See. I've checked it and I'm not sure why because it says you should be able to. So I'm going in deeper and we'll figure it out. So we'll try that. Otherwise, you guys will all get an email from us. Um, if you signed up for the Eventbrite, if you did not sign up for the Eventbrite, um, definitely type in the chat. And if you don't hear from us in like two days, definitely email us from that contact page and we will get a hold of you. Or you just call Dillard and say, I want to speak to art people. <laughs> okay, thank you. There's like a bunch of people here somewhere that also, you'll get some. also our emails. So, yeah. Ask us questions. If my mom applied through choice for the art. I, I have a question as well. Um, for the assignment where it said creativity, it, it won't let the, the link won't let me get in there for the assignment. I think we're experiencing some technical difficulties with the Canvas page. But um, if you want to type your email in the chat now, We'll definitely make sure to get a hold of yeah, you as we'll send everything through the event right. And we'll make sure to get you guys on. Okay, and thank you. Is it possible that the assignment didn't go live or they're just not getting into Canvas? There are many possibilities. There are. With Canvas. <laughs> but there, there are a lot of reasons why it could be, uh, but. It, the can, yeah, well, we're going to have to sort it out and everyone's going to get links and, and all kinds of good information in an email where it's all compact and everything will be right. I'm not sure why it's not working right now, guys, uh, but it is set up to have everything in there for you. Uh, so we're going to work on that. Um, I'd just like to point out, Ms. Dion, that there is a submission in there from an existing Dillard student. So the um, Canvas classroom itself is functioning. It just seems to be adding new um, students in there for some reason that's not quite going through yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pugo. <laughs> Appreciate it. Good. So maybe try, maybe try again. Maybe just give it another try. And Amelia asked a really good question. What if you're interested in art and other hobbies? Um, is it possible to do multiple things? You guys, this is Dillard. We have so many, many interesting things. Um, but you have to work your schedule very carefully because you still need um, English, math, science, social studies, and we need you to graduate from high school. But um, one of our <laughs> students, uh, Cosi Pierre-Lewis, he took not only all the drawing things, all the um, digital art and graphic art stuff, but he also took commercial music. And then he got a full ride and he took a uh, dual enrollment with Broward College and all our AP things. And he got a full ride scholarship to Duke, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, certainly if you're somebody with a lot of interests and you wanna do a lot of amazing work, Dillard might be the option for you. And Lanisha, um, let's look at your stuff um, later. It sounds like you applied to Mr. Charles's program for um, the fine arts. So definitely contact him 
to see, you know, if that works for you, because we'll just, we'll look up your status like tomorrow morning. Yeah, and uh, Crystal, that Canvas page that you're on is not the same one as Ms. Dion it was showing us earlier, but I can connect you to that one. So just continue to follow up with me in the email. I got your email earlier. You're on our Performing Arts Canvas page where we were introducing the program to students. Uh, but this Canvas page that she's speaking of is specific to tonight's presentation. So if you're unable to get on there, no worries. Just email me back as you did earlier today and I'll connect you and we'll make sure you get on. Maybe Sam could put on that Canvas page again, just for that link. And anyone that wants to check out the chat, um, it is working and letting students in. So it might be that you just need to give it another try. And there are two links in there. There's a link in there that is for current students. And then the second one is for those of you that aren't already in Canvas at all and wanting to check it out. Yeah, and guys, uh, Ms. Swanson put her email in the chat as well, and I put mine. So those are two points of contact. Uh, you can uh, record and reach out to either one of us if you have any subsequent questions. Uh, can I answer the question that, uh, I don't know if you answered this or not, uh, Ms. Swanson, uh, but Lanisha had a question about her portfolio. And uh, did you address that? I, I, I wanna hear you address it because it sounds like it's more for your program. Yeah, um, once you apply, Lanisha, uh, and if she's already applied, if she's already applied, you should have heard from us already, okay? Because if you, everyone that applied in the first window, we, uh, if it was for the visual and performing arts, then we reached out to you to talk to you about your portfolio. If you applied for emerging computer technology through Ms. Swanson's program, uh, you won't have to submit a portfolio for that. That entrance requirement is different. And um, I would say we're both going to probably double check tomorrow to make sure that we didn't miss you. Uh, but uh, if you if you apply in the second window, then at that time, once we get your application, we'll reach out to you and we'll talk to you about uh, how you need to submit your portfolio and arrange for your audition. <laughs> and to Chanel, the, the portfolios, once again, once you've applied to the program, we reach out to the applicants and we discuss the audition requirements with them and let them know what should be in the portfolio and how we would like it to be presented. And you'll get that information directly from Mr. Joseph and Ms. Black. Yep. Yeah. So and you guys, you let us know if you have any questions on the portfolio canvas page link is here on the PowerPoint that Mr. Lopez de Victoria is sharing right now. So. And um, I think Ms. Dion put a uh, put all of the emails in the chat as well. And uh, she has a screenshot that the uh, students can download also with contact information. And Lanisha um, just said that the yeah, the district had to change the date. Um, normally, you would have been notified early in March of your acceptance. However, um, and it sounds like maybe you're more with me because um, we don't have a portfolio requirement. We focus on the academics. Um, so definitely I'll look up your stuff tomorrow and we'll see where you guys are with the process. All right. Because we've, we've auditioned everyone that uh, we were able to contact in that first window. So if it's, if, if by chance, Lanisha, you knew you, you know, you were, uh, applying for drawing or painting or ceramics or any type of visual art and you haven't heard from us yet by all means uh, make sure you contact us now if you're going for the digital arts computer technology you'll be hearing from Ms. Swanson so And I'd also like to say uh, for any of uh, the parents that are uh, interested or curious about summer programs for art 
and are looking for uh, places that they can send their children uh, in the summer months, uh, you can reach out to uh, any of us as art teachers and uh, get some of that information, okay? Because we're pretty well connected to a lot of those different uh, organizations and groups. All right. Any other We're questions? <laughs> yeah, so um, you guys were good. You have our contact information. We're here to grow you guys as artists. Um, Aisha, what elementary school do you go to now? I go to Wilson Manor. Where? Wilson Manor. Wilson, Wilson Manor. All right, so you're nearby, so definitely we'll be excited to see you. And I think every single one of these teachers here will be excited to see you because you're already showing us work and that's what today was about. So yeah. you get it, so you just need to keep keep it up, keep being Send you. Send us some things to look at. Yes. Give us some stuff to talk about. Yes. And anybody else that's still on and just a little too shy to hold it up and talk about it, Go to that Canvas page and show us some of your work or get if you already have a portfolio, put it right in there. There are three assignments in there. One's that creativity challenge. That's uh, really great just for fun brain practice. And you've got a two other places where you can submit things. One, the actual portfolio and another just to show us what you got. Okay, Amelia has a question and she's asking if you're not that experienced in certain areas. Well, uh, when you attend a uh, fine arts academy, fine arts magnet, a computer technology magnet, it really depends, okay? The, the amount of experience that you may need to uh, study in the digital arts and get introduced into uh, certain elements of artistic technology, those requirements are a little bit different than if you are doing uh, the visual arts, where we really count on you to have a little bit more experience, a little bit more of the fundamentals established because of the rigor of the program. So when you come into the program, we're already at a certain level that's going to match the level of the other students that we've accepted. And so in order that we can chunk the information at the pace where it can be rigorous, uh, like a magnet program should be, we need you to be at a certain level. If you're not at that level right now, that doesn't mean that you should not continue to work at it. You can continue to uh, develop, uh, take some classes, go to some workshops, uh, study in some classes on the, at the school that you're at and continue to develop your skills and then come back and try that audition again. Uh, that, that is more applicable to the performing and visual arts. Um, Ms. Swanson, would you like to elaborate on uh, the type of experience needed for uh, emerging computer technology? So with emerging computer technology for our digital arts program, we expect you to be able to keep up with your academic rigor. And that's why we have academic requirements because some of the learning you're going to do with um, technology is just, it's going to be intense and we need to make sure that you can keep up. So generally we found that kids that have that academic background, they're going to do great. And you guys, you just apply, we will build you up. And that the whole idea is that you guys come in here, but that you want to be way up here. You come in and we have seen it happen. So we got all that. Um, Can I make a comment on that? Um, because Mr. Joseph and I do audition students that um, haven't had a great deal of, of previous classes, art classes. Um, you know, if you're a creative person, you're probably, you've probably been doing some drawing and, and maybe making some things and um, keep doing that. Okay, try to take some some classes during the summer, see if there's any programs, but on your own, you can do the one one thing that we talked about, and that is observational drawing. And the more you do it, 
the better you will get at it. And um, so don't give up quickly. If you try to draw a chair and you can't draw it, draw it again, or find something that's a little easier to draw, draw a banana, okay? Keep trying to draw and you'll be amazed. You get better with practice. And um, so we still want you to, we still want you to apply. We just want you to try your best to show us what you can do. Yeah. Okay? And to that, uh, that student's question, which uh, was, uh, was, all, was also included that it didn't just apply to art, but other areas of the school. But in this particular example, where the Canvas course is being established, that's a great opportunity to get great feedback. Whatever it is that you are striving to do, you won't always want to get a little feedback so that you know where you are. So if the bar is here, uh, someone may say, hey, you're right here, or you're right here. Or they may say, you're right here. Or they may say, you're right here. But at least you know what you need to work towards. So always try to get some feedback. And don't be afraid to get the feedback. If you really have the desire in your heart to be an artist or a singer or a dancer, and that's what you want to do, get an honest assessment of where you are and then work towards where you want to be. And that's what our program is about. Uh, so I always say audition anyway. Audition yeah. anyway and, and learn where you are. Because sometimes we don't have a lot of confidence in ourselves, but we have tremendous potential. And we just don't realize it. And we'll talk ourselves out of a good opportunity. So I would always encourage everyone to go ahead and audition. I see a couple more questions here uh, in the chat uh, to praise again. When should you show your art? Oh. Hey, you can use the, uh, use the uh, Canvas page and start getting some feedback right now. Uh, but once you apply, we're going to ask you to present that in a formal presentation for us, okay? Along with some other things uh, during the audition process. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Chanel uh, Middle School, there is a requirement for uniforms at the middle school level, okay? Uh, but grades nine through 12, uh, 12 do not uh, require uniforms. So I'm not sure what age group you're in, but we could uh, answer more specifically if you need to. Okay, and Ms. Swanson answered that. I should have read that. All right, I'm sorry. And a couple of the other questions. So I'm just babbling along. Let me be quiet. Well, you guys know, and we'll try to end up, I think, around 8.15. So we've got about three minutes left. So if you have anything quick, you can ask us, you email us. But um, Aisha, yeah, definitely submit digital art to the portfolio. Um, about what I can't speak about, and I think um, Laura can help me here also as well, is that the quality of the instructors here is extremely high. So you are getting free feedback from people who have masters in fine arts, which is the highest degree you can get in the fine arts field. And it's the same thing all those fancy college professors have. A lot of the teachers on here have their own fancy art like companies and they are running stuff and doing real art for museums. Mr. Joseph is an AP arts reader. That means he actually grades the AP art, not for Dillard kids, he's not allowed, but other kids and he teaches other teachers how to teach AP. So you guys are, every single teacher on here has a bachelor's of fine arts and many of them have their master's degree as well. So Laura, what do you think about the quality of the teachers here? Incredible. <laughs> you guys, it's a bargain. If you turn your art in and you get six teachers that can give you feedback, man, you are, you are getting some free things right there just to get some grow. There's, so, a, there's a question, when should I show my art? I think that has to do with the assignment and Ms. Dion, you wanna you wanna tackle that one one more time? When should we show our problem. art? I'm just I'm not looking at the question there. It's it's from praise and it says when should I show my art? And I think show us I your answered art right that now. a little earlier, Ms. Black. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> that's okay. I'll re I'll reiterate very quickly. Thank In you. the Canvas page, there are three assignments. 
One of them is for an official portfolio submission. The other two assignments are places for you to get creative and show us what you've got. One of them is the creativity challenge that Mr. Joe talked about, turning the number into something else or a character or a something. And the other one just says, show us your work because we know that you guys have things at home and we, you just might want some feedback. You might have a few questions. And when you submit that, you can submit screenshots, photos, any kinds of pictures, and you can type us little questions and we'll get back to you about that. Does that answer your question? I hope so. Um, yes, and um, what's, and also it's because like when I click on the link, yeah, they're just not working. Like I don't see it coming up. Uh, All right. Is your Canvas page coming up right now? So you do see portfolio building and you see assignments, but it's not coming up? Uh, yeah, the stuff's not showing here. Yeah. All right, let me go have another check at it, but it, it should be, so I'll go mess with it again. You guys, it's rounding up to 8.16 now. So um, I wanna thank all of the teachers and everyone here for all their hard work. Um, this isn't just one of those events you can just throw together. We've put a lot of work into this whole thing. So I just wanna thank every single one of the teachers and all of the students and teachers from other schools that showed up as well. Um, keep in touch, you know, you guys just email us, let us know. We're here for that. The alumni have been incredible as always. So yeah. we're just happy to see them. Great. And it's what it's all about. So you guys, everybody, big round of applause. And um, look for the email about the, uh, with the recording and everything else, and we'll put it up on the Dillard homepage. So you yeah. guys let us know and thank you all. And I hope you all have a great night. Good night, guys. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, thank, you, thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Have good a night, good night, everybody. Bye.